Hi, Sanjay. Hi, hi, Mike. Sanjay, welcome to our talks. So let me just tell Sanjay Sondhi is a Dehradun based naturalist. His natural history interests studying photographing he has a special interest in birds, butterflies, and all the more moths. He runs a nature conservation called Disney Trust. And in this talk, Sanjay will take us to explore the marvelous world of moths, take a peek into their funky lives, learn about some common moth families, and he'll show you how to take your first steps to identify them. So let's begin Moths for Dummies. Sanjay, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So is the screen on? Can everyone see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Nick. Uh, you know, as uh, Nick mentioned, uh, I'm a naturalist. I've had an interest in... Uh, I have an... A, can anyone, I hope there's no, if there's some issues in terms of audio, please uh, get into chat mode and let us know, right? Uh, so as Nick mentioned, I'm a naturalist. I'm, I have an interest in everything that moves other than humans. Uh, and, uh, you know, birds, butterflies, snakes, frogs, all of these, these things have been of interest to me. You know, the world of moths has been uh, relatively uh, new, new interest. When I mean relatively new, I've been in, interested in moths only in the last decade or so. And uh, the reason that is so is that I, I always thought that, you know, moths are dull. I mean, what's the point in looking at moths and they only uh, fly at night and so on and so forth. And uh, actually, a life-changing experience for me uh, occurred uh, almost a decade ago and uh, this moth that I've got on the screen there uh, it's, it has a scientific name which is called Baurisa hieroglyphica but I have nicknamed it the Picasso moth and this is the one of the moths that I saw on the on my first night of, moth, of mothing in Eagle Nest Wildlife Sanctuary in uh, 2009. So basically a friend of mine uh, Ramana Atraya and myself were hanging around at Lama Camp in Eagle Nest and uh, another friend had left uh, a moth screen and a bulb and we put that up saying let's see what happens and uh, that night in Eagle Nest, it was 20th of May 2009, we got uh, 3000 moths on the screen. Uh, Ramana and I were up till 5 a.m. photographing moths and as you can see on the screen, uh, moths aren't dull by any stretch of imagination. I mean, you know, you have colors of green and yellow and blue and red, and some moths I think are even prettier than butterflies. So clearly the moths world is not dull. And the, the kind of uh, uh, experience that knocked me out on at Eagle Nest was this one, something like this, where on a single screen, uh, you know, we had uh, a thousand moths in front, a thousand moths at the back and another thousand on the ground. And we just did not know where to look. And that's actually what got me interested in moths. And I said, man, this is something I really missed out on. And since then, I've been doing, you know, my bit to try and study and understand and get to know these creatures a little better. Uh, the world of moths, uh, I'm sure this is uh, 101 for many people, but still, belongs to an insect group called Lepidoptera, which means scaled wings. And both butterflies and moths have them. Uh, many people ask me, what's really the difference between butterflies and moths? And actually, there's, there, are, uh, there are very few differences between butterflies and moths. Uh, scientifically speaking, these are differences that are sort of uh, uh, designated by humans and by scientists. But for all practical purposes, they belong to the same group, which is called Lepidoptera and insects with scaled wings. Uh, globally, there are uh, uh, about 10 times as many moths as there are butterflies. So at this point in time, uh, we believe that there are something like a lakh and a half to two and a half lakh moth species. 
compared to roughly 18 odd thousand butterfly species. But uh, this is probably an underestimate because there are many, many, many moth species still to be described. In India, the number that's touted is 10,000 species. Uh, the real answer should be God knows. Or maybe even God doesn't know because we haven't really, really uh, been able to figure out what moths we have. And uh, both uh, as against this 10,000, we have about 1400 odd species of butterflies. So the moth diversity is much, much greater than butterflies, even in India. And in the Himalayas, uh, I would say Eastern and Western Himalayas put together, uh, we would, I would guess that there would be between five to 6,000 species. So good fun, lots to learn for people who are interested. And uh, believe it or not, the last comprehensive guide book on moths was actually published by a, a Britisher called G.F. Hampson in uh, you know, 120 years ago. And uh, I still remember that when I started in 2009, when I said, okay, now let's go out and see what literature exists on moths. The only thing that I found was these four books that were written by Hampson, uh, which had about six and a half thousand species. And it was published between 1894 and 1898. And for me, that was completely amazing because, you know, no internet. I don't know how the guy actually managed to list out 6,500 moth species since then. And uh, there's almost been no other publication of note in the Indian context. So what's the difference between butterflies and moths as designated by humans? So by and large, uh, most of this we know, butterflies fly during the day, they have clubbed antenna, they have a more powerful flight than moths. They usually sit with their wings uh, open or folded over its abdomen and the caterpillars and cocoons are different. And this is what moths are like. Many people tell me that, look, I, you know, I don't know much about moths, but how can I actually tell whether a species is a moth or a butterfly? Uh, one, of course, easy, the easiest way for, uh, you know, Nick tells me this is like moths for dummies. And I don't think anybody's a dummy, but the very first step is, hey, are you seeing it during the day or the night? I mean, most butterflies fly during the day. Most moths fly at night. So that's a very... Uh, the simplest way to start. And then if you want to go a little beyond that, uh, you, there's a little bit of complication because while most moths fly at night, there's many that fly during the day as well. So all of these moths that I've got on the screen actually fly during the day. So if you see something uh, and you don't know whether it's a butterfly or moth, what's the easiest way of trying to figure it out? This is probably the simplest way the antenna. So the antenna of butterflies is clubbed, as you can see in this butterfly called the Indian tortoise shell. Uh, and by club, I mean this club-like shape at the end of its antenna. Most moths don't have a clubbed antenna. So many moths have antennas that are something like, if you see a uh, an insect, a butterfly or a moth, and it has an antenna like this, it's, it's a moth. No question, no butterfly has an antenna like this. But not all uh, antenna of moths are feathery. They can be many different kinds. Uh, they can be in this shape, they can be in this shape, they can be like this. But for the better part, they're not clubbed. So that's really the uh, easiest way of separating butterflies and moths, which is just take a careful look at the antenna. Uh, and if you have a photograph, then it's very easy to tell. You can actually look at the antenna through the photograph and figure them out. Uh, both for butterflies and moths, the antenna are basically sensory organs. So they are able to actually sense a whole bunch of stuff. They're able to sense uh, other moth species. They're able to sense food. They're able to sense uh, you know, nectar and so on and so forth using antenna. Other differences between butterflies and moths, these are butterfly caterpillars. So most butterfly caterpillars are not hairy uh, and they come in many different shapes, but most of them largely not hairy. Uh, many butterfly, many moth caterpillars are hairy as you can see this one. Of course, 
Many of them are not hairy as well. But if you see something which has uh, got a lot of tufts of hair, more than likely it's, it's a moth caterpillar. Then the, in their early stages, uh, you can easily tell them apart. A butterflies, uh, the butterfly pupa is called a chrysalis, which is in this shape. Whereas a moth pupa is, is called a cocoon and it's in, typically in this shape. Now the difference between these two is moths uh, spin a cocoon using silk, whereas butterflies actually make their chrysalis out of uh, proteins. It's not, uh, their pupa is not spun out of silk. And they look very different. I mean, you can actually make out, uh, when you see a, an early stage of either a butterfly or moth, you can easily tell them apart. Identifying moths, I mean, uh, this is the tough one. I still remember when I started in 2009, we, I really, really struggled. I mean, how does one uh, tell moths apart? Uh, uh, there, are, uh, some, there are six butterfly families in India. There are more than a hundred moth families in India. So uh, clearly identifying moths is far more difficult than identifying butterflies. Uh, again, uh, you know, humans have designated moths into two broad groups. This is not a scientific classification. They are called macro moths and micro moths. The micro moths are those that are smaller than, you know, 20 millimeters typically, just purely based on size. And macro moths are the larger ones, but this is just a human designated uh, classification. Otherwise, there are many, many different families. There's uh, tiger moths. There's ermine and footman moths, there's owls and owlets, uh, there's prominent moths, lappet moths, emperor moths, and many, 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 many more families. What I'm going to do in this presentation is that uh, uh, I'm going to introduce some of the more common families. I'm going to talk about how people who don't know anything about moths can begin to look at moths and try and identify them. And then I'll also give you some tips in terms of if you actually have photographed moths or seen moths, how can you figure out which family it is? Uh, you know, because that's the first step. I mean, even before you get to the species, you need to know which family it belongs to. So I'm going to talk about that as well. So this uh, is a, a family of moths. This beautiful moth uh, is a, a saturnate or an emperor or silk moth. So these moths uh, typically are large and colorful. Uh, what I've got on the screen is uh, uh, most butterflies and moths nowadays are described. The size of these creatures is by is mentioned as the wingspan. And while I've indicated the wingspan uh, through arrows here, uh, scientifically speaking, actually the wingspan is twice the four wing length. So actually people will measure the length of the four wing from its base to the tip and they'll double it. And that really is the, uh, the, the size of the moth. So these moths, uh, Saturnids, are large and colorful. Believe it or not, these moths don't feed as adults. So they have lives which are for maybe a, between a week to three weeks maximum. Very, very short lifespans. And uh, many of them have tails, though some actually may be tailless as well. Uh, these are some examples of uh, moon moths or uh, emperor moths. This is the tassar silk moth. This is an emperor, golden emperor moth. This is the atlas moth. It's one of the largest moths. It is the largest moth in the world by wingspan. Uh, not by size, but by the area of the wings. This is one of the moon moths. Uh, so they come in many, many different shapes and sizes. Uh, very sought after by collectors because these moths as you can imagine I mean like this moth the atlas moth if it sits on your face it covers your face it's as big as your hand so uh, much sought after by collectors uh, because of their colorful size uh, color the color and their size uh, these moths uh, uh, have lots of interesting stories behind them one such story is uh, that of these tailed uh, emperor moths. So, you know, 
people wondered as to what, why should these moths actually have tails? Because the tails are actually uh, make them clumsier in flight than non-tailed moths. And uh, as many of you would know, the primary predator for moths, especially the nocturnal ones, are bats. Now, how do bats hunt moths? So basically, bats hunt moth using uh, sonar or sound waves. So, uh, you know, bats and moths have been having ec an ecological warfare that has probably extended back to hundreds of years, millions of years, probably. So what these emperor moths do is that these tails are actually a defense mechanism for them against uh, bats. So what happens is studies have proved that uh, these tails are twisted and they help to deflect the uh, sound waves produced by the bats in a different direction, thereby confusing the bat. So the bats emits a sound, the moth twists it and sends it in a different direction. So the bat does not know where the moth is. People actually did experiments where they put in tailed and non-tailed moths uh, in a closed container with bats and they found that the tailed ones had a greater rate of survival than the non-tailed ones. So basically the tails of moths are uh, uh, just one form of a defense mechanism by these large moths to defend themselves against predatory bats. What does this look like? To me, it looks like a snake. And if you look at it, this is actually the portion of uh, the atlas moth and the markings of the atlas moth. And it's a large moth, you know, as I said, it, it's as big as your palm, it, it can cover your face. So imagine some other creature seeing this moth partially hidden amongst the leaves. And what it sees is a, just a part of the moth, which actually makes it seem that it's a snake. So many, many moths use patterns for camouflage and deception. And uh, we believe that the Atlas moth uses these snake-like markings to defend itself against potential predators. The next uh, interesting family of moths is called hawk moths or swingid, swingidae. These are also big moths. Uh, they have wingspans between 70 to 120 mm. Uh, most of them are large. They have these stout bodies here. And uh, they have this jet shaped configuration. And they are nectar feeders. So if you see a large moth, stout bodied, jet shaped like this, uh, it's definitely, it's likely to be a, uh, a hawk moth. And uh, uh, they're also migratory. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them have been known to travel as much as 100 kilometers uh, from place A to place B during, uh, based on uh, the temperature and other seasonal factors. The caterpillar of, this is the caterpillar of uh, a, a hawk moth, a stout uh, without any hair and with the tail that you can see here. So the tailed caterpillars uh, that you see without hair and big bodied, stout bodied are basically all hawk moth caterpillars. So this is basically the caterpillar of a common moth called the oleander hawk moth, which feeds on uh, the oleander plant. Uh, you should be able to see it in Delhi, I mean, all throughout the country and it's, it's a fairly common moth species. These are some examples of hawk moths. As you can see, almost all of them have the jet shaped, like fighter jet shaped uh, overall appearance. And all of them have fairly stout bodies. These are some more examples. Most hawk moths are nocturnal, but there are this group, the coffee bee hawk moth, which is a diurnal moth, it basically flies during the day, uh, feeding on flower nectar. I assume lots of you have heard of uh, this moth, which is called the death's head hawk moth. 
the reason why people know this moth is because of the film Silence of the Lambs. You know, the uh, in that movie, the death's head moth is considered a symbol of death. And I don't know whether any of you, rem if you recall that uh, victims uh, in the movie, uh, the murderer used to actually leave a moth in the mouth of the person uh, as, a, as a symbol of death. So even today, even in, when we go to rural India, I have people telling me that if moth in our home, so it means that death is coming, which is all bunkum, of course. It doesn't mean anything. But uh, this common moth uh, is, also, is also sometimes called the bee robber. Uh, and uh, very interestingly, the primary food for this moth is basically honey. And uh, what this moth does is it has a very stout proboscis or the tube through or the mouth part through which it sucks its food. And this straw-like uh, mouth part or proboscis uh, is what it used to feed on uh, nectar. But if it wants to feed on uh, uh, feed on honey, and if it wants to feed on honey, it needs to get to beehives. Now, if it gets to beehives, it's more than likely that uh, the bees are going to sting them. So what the moth does is the moth produces a chemical which makes it smell like a bee. So the bees think that the moth is one of them. And actually, as you can see here, the uh, moth can actually sit on a beehive and feed without any fear of the bees attacking them. Uh, this moth, very interestingly, also makes squeaks. If you actually catch it in your hand, uh, the moth will squeak in your hand. And uh, it actually makes that uh, mouth, uh, it makes that uh, sound using the pharynx. I mean, it's believed that because it has, uh, it feeds on honey through a mouth part, which is very strong, it is able to use that to produce squeaks. And the squeak is an anti-predatory mechanism. If there is some predator that comes close to it, it starts squeaking and uh, hopefully scares its predator away. A third common family is called the geometer or the geometry, geometry day is the family, geometer moths. So these moths typically have wingspans between 20 to 80 mm, uh, you know, small to moderate sized, medium sized. And uh, all of them sit with their wings flat, like this. And in the case of geometrical moths, you can see all the four wings. One, two, three, four. In most cases, all the four wings are visible. In addition to that, the abdomen, unlike, this is the abdomen, unlike uh, hawk moths, it's slender. And the antenna are typically, as you can see here, are along the the margin of the wing. So this typically is what you look for. If it's a moth that is sitting flat, uh, sitting with all four wings visible, its antenna along the wing, it's probably a geometrid moth. So how does this moth get its name? This is a geometrid moth caterpillar. Uh, the word geometra actually means earth measurer. And uh, the caterpillars of these uh, uh, of this moth family is basically called loopers or inchworms. And the reason is because they lack the legs in the middle of the body. And hence, when they walk, they actually loop. As you can see, this is how the moth typically sits. But when it walks, it has to loop. So they are called loopers or inchworms. And the word geometra say, comes from the fact that people say that the reason why the moth is looping and walking is actually measuring the circumference of the earth. And hence, uh, geometra actually literally means earth measurer in Latin. These are all geometrid moths. As you can see, they, all these moths are sitting flat. The antenna are typically along the wings. This is some more examples. Again, all the four wings are visible. It's sitting flat. So these are all examples of geometry and moths. This funky uh, thing that you can see uh, had me completely blown. So this is the, the caterpillar of a day flying moth uh, called uh, uh, the false uh, tiger moth, dysphania. 
and uh, believe it or not the caterpillar often sits like in this posture to uh, to protect itself and i photographed it with this fly on it and i was wondering what the fly is doing and only after i photographed it and i looked at this on the computer i realized that these are the eggs of the fly this is basically a tachyd fly and these are eggs that the fly has laid on the caterpillar uh, only 3 to 4% of caterpillars of butterflies and moths reach adult uh, reach an adult moth or caterpillar uh, uh, moth or butterfly either they get eaten but most of them get parasitized so a very large number the biggest threat to caterpillars is parasites uh, they can be wasps, they can be flies, they can be fungal infection, a whole bunch of stuff. But parasitism, parasitism is the single biggest threat to the caterpillar world. Uh, even more interestingly, what happens is that this, you know, the, the fly tells the caterpillar, hope you live long because it only feeds uh, its uh, young ones, uh, fresh, live caterpillars. So what happens is that these eggs stay on the caterpillar. Uh, the the eggs hatch, the larva of the fly enters the body of the caterpillar and eats it fresh. And actually, in many, many cases, the caterpillar continues to live till the larva are in the body of, uh, till the larva are, are alive. So, and then when the larva finally are big enough to leave, then the caterpillar is basically completely hollowed out by the parasites different kind of parasite this is basically a moth that is on which uh, uh, fungal infection fungus is growing and it's been parasitized by fungus and this is another caterpillar moth caterpillar which is uh, parasitized by wasps and i don't know how many of you have heard of this thing that get, gets collected in the high altitude areas of uttarakhand and other himalayan regions Chira Jerry, uh, Yarsa Gumba, which you know, the Chinese believe is a great aphrodisiac. This sells for anything between 130 to $500,000 per kg, uh, uh, 1000 per kg, $150,000 per kg. And basically this fungus that you're seeing parasitizes a caterpillar, which is a ghost moth caterpillar. So basically the caterpillar of this moth remains underground in high alpine meadows. The fungus gets onto the caterpillar and when the fungus is willing, is ready to uh, give out its spores, it sends a message to the caterpillar which makes it rise to the surface of the earth. And the caterpillar of course dies and the fungus then lets out its spores so that it can spread. And this whole thing, the fungus and the caterpillar together are collected. And uh, that is what is called Kira Jedi or Yarsa Gamba and uh, a heavy price paid for by the Chinese. Another moth family, this is basically a moth family which is called Arctidae, uh, Arctinae or tiger moths. These are medium sized moths, 40 to 60 mm wingspan, very brightly colored. And the reason they are brightly colored is they don't care if they get seen. The reason they don't care if they get seen is because they are both bitter tasting and they are foul smelling. So they don't care. I mean, they, are, they want predators to actually come and try to eat them. Uh, predator may try once, but very quickly learns that the moth is, is horrible to smell and very, very bitter to eat. And uh, hence, it, in the future, they avoid these moth species. They, the predators recognize them and avoid them. For those predators that are very persistent and they don't agree, the moth lets out this frothy secretion from the head and I've actually smelt it and oh my god it's, it's a horrible horrible smell and uh, so it actually secretes this frothy foam from its head which acts as a further deterrent because it becomes that makes the smell even worse and believe it or not uh, this is valuable chemicals for the moth so after it scared the predator away it sucks these bubbles back into the body because it doesn't want to lose them because it's uh, it's uh, valuable material so it bubbles out and it bubbles in again these are this is a caterpillar of uh, 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 the tiger tiger moths 
most of them are very hairy and uh, hence they're also called woolly bears some of them are itchy not not all <clears throat> but if you see a caterpillar of this kind lots of long hair it's likely to be a woolly bear or a tiger moth caterpillar in this family uh, most of these moths will be brightly colored as you can see very interestingly uh, tiger moths and bats have been taking uh, ecological warfare to uh, different level so you know bats of course uh, hunt by sound so they issue their sound waves uh, the moth uh, too can issue uh, emit clicks so when the bat starts emitting sounds uh, the tiger moths also emit clicks to warn them that hey i'm here and i'm a toxic moth don't come near me uh, and uh, the moths can also sense uh, how close or far a bat is uh, they actually can sense the clicks of the bat uh, believe it or not this warfare between moths and bats is, is like such an ongoing affair that there are some bats that have become smarter uh, because they know that moths can hear the clicks and can, you know when the bat comes closer the, the clicks become louder so there are some bats that have actually strategized that they reduce the intensity of clicks as they come closer to the moth to try to fool the uh, the moths that are actually moving away from you and not coming close to you then there are other moths that what they have is they have many moths have lots of hairs on the body and these are sound absorbers for them so they actually don't allow the sound waves to get reflected so basically moths and bats have been fighting each other for i don't know centuries and they keep evolving and coming up with new tricks to save themselves same family arctid moths but these moths are called footmen moths or lichen moths uh, these are small sized uh, 20 to 40 mm in wingspan and as you can see the the moth has got like a foot shape or a cylinder like shape when the moth sits uh, and hence uh, they are called footmen moths these are also bitter tasting they are also uh, brightly colored because they want to warn predators that uh, we are here and uh, these are some uh, footmen moths you know as you can see all of them are long foot like or slender like shaped when they sit and some of you may have seen it guess what this is i remember when i first saw this i was left scratching my head saying what the hell is this man and so it turns out that this is basically the igloo of this footman moth so what the caterpillar of this moth does is it uh, removes its own hair and builds an igloo like structure in which it suspends the cocoon in which uh, for protection and the hairs of the caterpillar are basically uh, anti predatory so they've got uh, you know uh, bitter taste and perhaps some smell also that keeps predators away thereby protecting uh, the the cocoon in fact if you go to any forest rest house uh, anywhere in the country in the right season you will see these on the walls so basically these are the what is the right season uh, typically in the in the summer months if you are uh, there uh, any any time between may june uh, to perhaps august you should see these uh, in forest rest houses in most parts of the country then there are uh, uh, a family called eribidae or owl moths large sized moths which are like between 80 to 120 mm and as you can guess they have these uh, eye like markings that make them seem as though they've got uh, it's like an owl you know these are owl eyes that are used to fool predators and if you actually cover the moth and only look at the eyes that act for a predator it may actually seem like uh, a large creature with eyes peering back at them so they it acts as an anti-predatory mechanism for the so these moths are uh, basically uh, uh, they like rotting fruit they like wine they love beer i mean you put a rope dipped in beer and you're pretty much likely to get these moths in the same family is the fruit piercing moths this is also a large moth 80 to 120 mm 
and uh, they have a very strong spined mouth part proboscis which helps them bore into fruit and uh, and and they can even bore into raw fruit raw fruit ripe fruit they love them all so these guys are not friends of uh, you know fruit growing farmers for sure and uh, in the same family are vampire moths which are actually blood suckers so they actually have a, a proboscis which has got these spines and they can actually uh, break mammal skin to suck blood so these guys don't suck blood but these guys do and we actually have some of these uh, moths in india as well same family another group of moths these are called the underwings these are also medium to large size moths 60 to 90 mm and uh, these guys have uh, this is how the moth usually sits you disturb it and this is what it does so basically they use uh, what they call this as a startle anti predatory strategy which is if uh, if they sense a predator is close by they open their wings and show these bright colors to scare its predator by startling it so typically it's sitting on a tree trunk camouflage it senses something it's close to it it quickly opens its wing shows a bright color and then flies off and that extra few seconds that it gets before it flies off helps to save it uh, another family these are uh, again very common especially in delhi you will see these uh, in uh, you know if you if you have a house which is near a field you should definitely see these these are very small moths wingspans of 20 25 mm they have this they have the a triangular shape to the body and the antenna is always pointed backwards see in in geometry it was along the along the wing here it is over the abdomen pointing backwards so this is basically these are grass moths and uh, the reason why i said you'll see them in open fields is that uh, many of these they caterpillars are stem borers so they basically go into grass stems and other plant species stems and they uh, live inside the stem and uh, hence they are called grass moths as well so whenever you have an open field you will get a lot of grass moths these are some grass moths for you as you can see in all cases you have antenna pointing back and a general triangular shape and small size these are some more grass moths another common family uh, slug moths or cup moths called limocodidae uh, these guys are mostly non feeders they have reduced mouth parts live for only a few weeks and uh, the cool thing about these uh, moths is that uh, if you are standing under a jamun tree or a mango tree and something like this falls on your head run these are the moths these are the caterpillars of this moth uh they are extremely itchy uh, and extremely uh, toxic bitter tasting and uh, uh, if you touch it you you'll get uh, you'll get high iq high iq means high itch quotient and it will sting and hurt for at least uh, half an hour uh, they are so toxic so the brightly colored caterpillars with spines like this is basically a slug moth or a limocodid and these are examples of uh, some slug moths this uh, these moths also have a very funky strategy they change their own shape like this so they they will raise the abdomen and they'll sit in this manner basically to change the shape it doesn't look like a moth anymore it looks like some other funky creature so basically this is these are the common families there are many many other families that i won't get into there's burnet moths there's hook tips there's goat and leopard moths and you know this is endless we can keep going uh, as i said 100 families in india so key question is how does one identify them i mean you uh, you know you don't know about moths you want to start and you say oh my god 100 families i mean sanjay scared me right in the beginning so often i put this slide up and i tell people if you're a beginner forget this slide this doesn't mean anything all you need to know is whether it's a butterfly or a moth they have four wings four wing hind wing four wing hind wing this is a mirror image of the other side and that's what you need to know you need to know you need to observe what patterns it has 
and uh, you need to figure out uh, which family it belongs to. So how the hell do you start doing that? So for beginners, my suggestion is the easiest way to begin identification of moths is to use the Moths of India website. And I remember Nick had sent me a moth, I think a week or two ago, and I, rather than identifying the moth, I told him, look on the website, look here. So what's the easiest way to do this? So basically, if you get onto the Moths of India website, and I'm going to do that now and show you, you can search by uh, families or you can search by state. So let me switch screens for a minute. I need to stop this share and I need to share this. Uh, hang on. Can I fix this? And share screen in this one. So I hope everyone can see the screen now. So this is the Moths of India website that I, sh that I told you about. Best place to start is this. You know nothing about Moths. How do you begin? So basically this website has got a section here which says an introduction to some common Moth families. You just click here and you get a, and a single, at a single place a collection of different kinds of moths. So the first thing you do is scroll down and take a look as to the moth that you have. With, does it resemble any of these? Hopefully it does. Suppose you think, ah, I think it's a grass moth. It looks very much like a grass moth. Go to this, click here, and this will give you a gallery of all the, hawk moth, all the grass moths that are on this website. So this, it just shows you one moth of, uh, you know, just a, a sample moth of that kind. And this is the easiest place to begin. So if you see a moth that you think is a footman moth or say a tiger moth, you click here and this gives you all the, gives you a gallery of now, if you're lazy and you say, yeah, who is going to go through all of this? There's an easier way to do this. You can go to an advanced search function here. And you say, okay, I live in the country. And you say, okay, I live, let's say, let's say Assam. You go to Assam and you do search images. And you get a, a sample of all the moths that are on this website from Assam. So it's a good easy place to start. So let's say suppose you're from Delhi. Delhi won't have any moths because there are very few moth watchers in Delhi I think. So well, I assume you're on this. You need more people to upload stuff yeah, from yeah, Delhi. So this is a sample of the moths that are on this website from Delhi. And there's a good chance that the moth that you're looking at will be here because uh, this has all the common moths that are found in Delhi. So that's these two things, you know, using uh, the common families and using the state to search is a nice way to, to do this. A another interesting thing is that this has also got life cycles. So basically, it's got. Uh, Ouch, sorry, it's got uh, early stages of moths. So it's got caterpillars, it's got pupa and so on and so forth. So suppose you see a caterpillar somewhere and you don't know, you think it's a moth caterpillar. You can go to advanced search. You can go to live stage, say caterpillar and do a search. And this will give you a gallery of the caterpillar, the moth species that are on this website. I mean, it's not comprehensive, but given the fact that we have 1265 species on this, uh, on the website, it's a good place to start. So this is my suggestion. This is the easiest way to start. Uh, 
and uh, I would encourage people to try it and see if it works. And uh, I, what I have now is I have a small quiz which we can, if we can get into chat mode, uh, we can't talk, but you can send messages, I think. So if uh, people would like to take a guess of which moth family this is, and uh, people on this can uh, send a message by chat and see whether you can guess what it is. Ladies, what do you say? Hawk moth. Yeah. Singwed hawk moth. That's right. It is stout bodied. It is jet like shape to the wing. So absolutely right. It is uh, a convolvulus hawk moth. It's, you'll actually see it in Delhi. It's quite common. So it is a, a swinged or a hawk moth. Next one, who's guessing? This is a large moth, 120 millimeters. What do you think it is? Owl moth. Not an owl moth. It does have eyes, but emperor moth. Emperor moth. That is correct. So, uh, I mean, uh, the eyes are not uh, exclusive domain of the owl moths, right? They can be other moths that have. Uh, so, this is basically an emperor moth, uh, Saturnid. Saturnia sedosa is the name. Uh, what about this one? It's a small moth. 20 millimeters in size, triangular shape, antenna going back. What do you think it is? Grass moth. Grass moth is what people are saying. Absolutely correct. It is a grass moth. Great. Right. This one, small moth, size uh, maybe about 30 mm, brightly colored, cylinder shaped. Footman, 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 footman. Yup, everyone's getting it. Great. So good. Lichen or footman moth is absolutely correct. And this one, sitting flat, all the four wings visible, medium size, antenna, not at back, but along the wings. What do you think this could be? This is about 50 mm in terms of wingspan. They're all answering geometry. They're answering geometry. Great. Absolutely right. It is a, it's called a tea looper. Uh, this moth lays eggs on coffee and tea and cardamom and a whole bunch of plants. It's a big pest actually for uh, spice growing communities, but very common again all throughout India. And the last one, which one's this? This one I'm sure everyone will get. You can't miss its eyes, right? It's a large moth, about 90 millimeters in terms of wingspan. And uh, any answers? Owl moth. Owl, owl moth. Everyone's getting it. Yeah. Absolutely right. It is the owl moth. And uh, last one. Brightly colored, about 60 mm in wingspan. Uh, Arctinate tiger. Arctinate tiger moth. Absolutely right. So great. So this gives you a good sense of, you know, you can, uh, you know, you know, the common families and you can figure out which moths it is. Uh, so here's a nice exercise for you guys. Uh, okay. So I'm going to leave you with a small, uh, with some prizes, opportunity to win prizes. So we've got uh, uh, Pawalgar and Devalsari moth brochures. So for people who are just beginners, if you register, if you can register on the Moths of India website, and if you can upload five identified moth species, there should be five different species, not the same species. Once you've done that, you can drop me an email saying I've done five species. And the first five people to do so will win a set of these brochures, which I'll just show you. Uh, but this is only eligible to new users. So people who are already on the website and have already contributed images, they don't qualify. So this has to be, uh, 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 should not be an existing registered user. And these are the brochures. So basically moths of Powellgard and moths of Devalsari. There are about 90 species each. So about 180 moth species is a good place to start, especially for Northern India and the Himalayas. So you, you can uh, win this. If you do this, there's no time limit for this, but it's the first five, you know. So whoever does this first uh, gets a chance. You can send me the details and we will ship, ship these to you directly. Okay.
uh, before I end this presentation, uh, many people ask me, uh, you know, how should we moth? If we want to watch moths, what should we do? So the thing is, you need a light source, ideally mercury vapor or actinic, but even a normal bulb will do. If you're in a remote place, then you need uh, electricity because the darker your location, the lower the light pollution, the better it is. Uh, uh, but Moths get affected by habitat, moths get affected by ability to see the light, they get affected by weather. The best time of the year is new moon. If there is no moon in the sky, uh, the likelihood of more moths coming to your screen are good. And obviously they are uh, cold-blooded creatures, so if you go to a very cold place, say the Himalayas in the winter, you aren't going to see many moths. Uh, they have, they, you'll see many, many more moths during the warm and the rainy seasons. Time of the day also varies. So, for example, the limacodids or the slug moths are the first to fly. 6.30 in the evening, you'll see them coming to the screen. Saturnids and Imperium moths typically fly late, maybe at 6, 6.30, uh, maybe at 12, 12.30 at night is the good time to see Saturnids. And uh, uh, this is a sample of light sources. Mercury vapor bulb, uh, something called a lepi lead. Or the simplest for a beginner is uh, an actinic tube light which goes into these, uh, you know, what's called the blue light, what goes into insect repellent. You can get this in any store. So these light sources are better than uh, sodium vapor or, uh, a, uh, you know, the, the LED that you use at home. Uh, the wavelength of light they emit attracts moths better than the ones, the normal bulbs you use at home. And this is a typical moth screen, but you can even have a white wall, you can have a white screen, it works. It's good enough. Um, books, if people are interested in, uh, Shubha Lakshmi came out with this uh, uh, field guide to Indian moths, which has 700 odd species. You can get that. It's an expensive book, but still uh, good for beginners. It costs about three and a half thousand bucks. Uh, we did this book on uh, butterflies and moths of Pakke, which has got about 180 species. Uh, so you can use these field guides in conjunction with the moth website to begin. Okay. So I am going to end this session with the, uh, the question of the day. Uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, Nick has uh, worked with uh, Zeiss and there's exciting prizes to be won. So I'm going to put a question up for you on the screen and uh, you have to answer that, send, uh, you know, submit it, submit your answer to this link. And uh, there's a, I think binocular, harness and a Zeiss cleaning kit that's available to the best answer. And uh, you need to send your answers in in the next 48 hours. So like we will, you know, wait till I think Nick will tell you as to what's the last time. And here's the question. So some moths are dull, but many moths are brightly colored. If moth, most moths fly at night, why do they need to be brightly colored? So, Anchal, my wife sitting over here saying, Prita's on the call, you're not allowed to answer this. No, no, but you are. Anyone's allowed to answer this. So, this is the question. You can note it down. Take a photograph on your mobile phone if you like. And uh, with this, uh, I end my session. Uh, you know, we can have question and answers after this. Uh, these are my contact details. This is my email. Uh, you can make a note of this as well. And uh, thanks to Nick and Delhi Birds for setting this up. And uh, if people have any questions, we can take those now. Yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. Nick, over to you. You can, if you can moderate this, uh, you'll have to unmute them. Uh, all right, Sanjay, so he'll decide. Uh, Nick gave me the responsibility to. Oh, yeah. hi, sir. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so, so one thing first. Yeah, uh, how are you doing? Everything is okay in Dehradun. Yeah, man, everything's okay, but no field trips. Our Garo no trip got cancelled, yeah. as you know. We, so, yeah, we we're sitting out. in crying. Yeah. So, hey, look, so wait one sec. Wait one sec. Sanjay, can you put that thing on the screen? That you're, you're the last slide, where people can. No, no. Yeah, this one. Thanks. Okay, so well over to you. Okay, so uh, uh, Sanjay. Uh, some people had asked a few questions. You already answered most of them. Okay. So uh, let me start out by asking you 
uh, you you told us about the mod screen and how to set it up. Yeah, so question what would you say lesson. would be a normal <laughs> session? Like how if I am looking for mods, uh, what time do I have to devote? Does it need to be two hours in the night, or do I need to go every two hours check because there are going to be different mods at four o'clock or six o'clock in the night? Yeah, so it, it, that. Okay, okay. So basically, it depends on it depends on you, right? I mean, if you are a if you are a serious moth watcher, uh, typically what we do is that we start uh, we start our moth session just as it is getting dark, uh, because there are moths that fly at dusk; uh, they are crepuscular. And we normally, if we have an electricity source which is reliable, we normally keep the moth screen up all night till uh, till uh, dawn. And normally, what we do is that we go out. I mean, so typically we will be at the moth screen continuously till eleven or twelve, and then every hour or every couple of hours we go back to the screen and check as to what moths have come. And as I mentioned, this is typically because different there are different moth groups that fly at different times. So the Saturnids typically fly after midnight. So if mm -hmm. you only have your moth screen up till ten o'clock, you're probably going to miss the Saturnids. There are some species that fly early in the morning. So if you don't have it on early in the morning, you'll miss that. But the good thing is that you can uh, you can even you know stay awake till twelve, leave the screen on, get up uh, before sunrise, and most of the moths might still be on the screen. So you can do that as a strategy. That's good to know. Thanks. So, Sanjay, can uh, you put the screen off so that we can see you, Sanjay? You need to put the screen off. We can then see you. Thanks. No, no, Did off I? so that we can see you. Stop sharing. I stop sharing, didn't I? Perfect. I perfect. Dikra? No, 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 I can see your face. Yeah? Now your face is gone. What did I do? Ah, now it's okay. Now it's okay? Hmm. Yeah, it's can fine. You see? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So, hello. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yes. No one said that. Okay, so uh, uh, okay, we, we are fine. We are, we are fine. So, okay, huh. we're fine. Anchal, Anchal, I can hear you. Clearer okay. than Sanjay. We can see. So, yeah. Okay. Go on. Okay. Yeah, Sanjay, the um, uh, talk is uh, like always been absolutely fantastic, and you made it way way simpler for what people to actually start using Moths of India website, and your comment was noted. That uh, yeah, Delhi needs more data to get on. So I think this talk is really going to help them. But you Very know, the good. first first uh, thing that comes to uh, people's mind is why do these uh, moths actually circle around these lights? What is happening? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we see it every day. Uh, if we are lucky in our houses now in Delhi, we also pollute it. Right. But, uh, why does it happen? Why are these moths circling around lights? So the thing is that this. Uh, this this question of why are moths attracted to light uh, actually has no simple answers. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the oldest view uh, was that uh, the reason moths are attracted to light is that uh, moths navigate by using the moon uh, and uh, they mistake the bright light that you have that they see as uh, as uh, the moon source, and they are using it for navigation. They come close to the the light, and then they get confused. That's one theory. There's another theory which says that uh, actually uh, the bright light that uh, moths are seeing creates a chemical reaction in their eyes that attracts them to the light. Mm -hmm. There's a third theory that says that. Uh, Actually, if you see a moth, you know, it actually circles around the light or, or a candle. It actually circles around it rather than sitting on the light. And I saying that, uh, you know, you've seen the, you know, that there's a shadow zone around any light, the umbra and penumbra phenomena. So actually what yeah. the moth is doing is they are actually circling around the, the shadow of the light. But none of these theories is conclusive and uh, the real answer is we still don't really, really know. I mean, none of these theories have seemed to work universally for all moth groups. So there are many, many different hypotheses, but none of them are absolutely and uh, conclusively proved as of now. But all of them, there's an element of truth, which means, you know, the moon theory, the chemicals theory, the uh, uh, penumbra theory, all of them have some element of truth. 
Okay, so there was a question here by uh, Jaya Rakesh, which is, will moth screens affect moth behavior and accumulate all species in one place? Of course, will they go away in the morning? Okay, so the thing is, uh, a good question, because, uh, you know, the thing, two, three things. Number one, uh, I think there, I don't think they affect moth behavior, uh, but what they do, do is they do disrupt the moths. Uh, there's no question about that. In the sense that if they're sitting on the moth screen, they're not feeding. So if it's a feeding moth and it's actually come to your screen and it's sitting on the screen, then it's not feeding for that duration, number one. Number two, uh, when we put up a moth screen, what I always do is that I am I get up early, in, if I'm leaving it on the whole night, I get up early in the morning or if you're, say, if you're watching till 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, and then what I do is I actually brush the moths off the screen. And the reason I do that is if you leave the moth screen on or if you leave the light on and uh, it becomes uh, daylight, what is going to happen is that you're going to have birds come and eat the moths. Absolutely. Yeah. So you need to be absolutely certain that you, you shake your moth screen, you get the moths to fly away from the screen so that they are protected at the end of your moth session. Whether you're ending at night or whether you're ending early morning, the same thing holds true. But otherwise, I don't think there's any impact on their long-term behavior. I don't think there's any impact. Of course, there is. I mean, you do what, uh, you know, some of them do get eaten by toads and praying mantis, which are also attracted to the light. But that's a very, very small number. Okay. And uh, another question, uh, which was earlier on the chat by Aisha Sultana, was that uh, uh, you talked about the hawk moth and the bees, the bee stealer. Yeah. Is it considered to be mimicry of the, is it some sort of mimicry that the moth is doing of bees? No, the, the, the chemical uh, scent, so to say, that the moth produces when it goes onto the bee hive is a form of mimicry. I mean, it's chemical mimicry, right? It, uh -huh. It's using, it's, uh, it, it is fooling the bees by making them believe that it's one of them. Uh, so it's not mimicry, but it's deception. I mean, in a manner of speaking. It makes the bees believe that the moth is also one of them and hence it protects itself. I mean, mimicry okay. typically is used Are when there it is any more questions by people. Uh, yeah. Why do we see them more in rainy season? Why do we see them more in rainy season? So the thing is that uh, uh, typically uh, emergence of butterflies and moths uh, is linked to availability of food. Okay. Now, uh, in the case of uh, butterflies, uh, butterflies typically uh, fly during the day and are active when there is sunlight. Now, moths uh, don't fly at night, so they don't need the sunlight. So they are almost entirely driven by that they want to emerge and fly when climatic conditions are such that there is maximum amount of food for them and for their larvae. And uh, the time when you have a great deal of food, especially in terms of greenery, is during the monsoon season. And they're not bothered whether there is sunlight or not. So uh, basically, it's temperature, con temperature and humidity conditions for moths are really good during the monsoon seasons. And because they don't need sunlight, they're okay to fly during that period. That's not to say that that is uh, the only time during the, they fly because many moths are short-lived. There are some moths that fly only in April. There are some moths that fly only post-monsoons. So different moths have different things. But yes, generally a very large number of moths fly during the monsoon season because the climatic conditions are suitable for them to be active and for their lava to be active. Okay. Uh, another question we have here is uh, by Rakesh Kumar, do moths migrate and what is the nature of this migration? How far do they migrate? So, the, uh, so in India, for example, I don't think much work has been done on moth migration. Uh, I do know that people have studied uh, 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 hawk moth migration uh, in, in India and they, they basically followed what they call this capture, mark and release uh, technique where they actually capture the moth, they mark it and they let it go. And hawk moths have been known to fly, migrate up to 100 kilometers in the Himalayas, elevationally. I mean, so they basically, if they are, uh, uh, you know, they're up in the hills and it becomes really cold, uh, 
the hawk moth may fly uh, down into the foothills by as much as up to 100 kilometers. Oh. Many other moths we don't know because they haven't been studied. Like most things in moths. Sorry? Like most like things in moths. Like most, like things, most in moths. things in moths. Right. Yes, yes, yes. The next question we have here is by our uh, common friend Shashank. He, he's asking, is there a need to collect or just photos are enough? Your views. So the thing is that uh, there is a need to collect. But uh, the thing is, uh, uh, for most moths, uh, you know, the difficulty about people wanting to get into moths is that number one, uh, very few moths in India have common names. Uh, many moth species in India are cryptic in nature, which is uh, externally they may be absolutely identical, but uh, uh, the only way to tell them apart is by examining genitalia. I'll actually give you an example of a moth that, in fact, just in the last two days we were discussing. You know, my son Yash, who also studies moths, was uh, uh, did uh, uh, a moth survey in Kerala in 2014. He had permits from the forest department. He collected moths. And we found a moth that he had not identified uh, amongst the collection. And that moth looked very, very similar to another moth that was found basically in Borneo and Malaysia. Mm. And so we checked with the guy who described that moth species from Borneo and Malaysia. And he said, hey man, your moth is different. It looks the same, but there are minor differences. We need genitalia to confirm. Fortunately, we had specimens. And we are now going to dissect them and examine the genitalia and it's likely it's going to be a new moth species. So the thing is, yes, you need to collect, but I think the right people should collect. And the collection should be housed in a museum where you know that they're going to be taken care of. And thirdly, you should not just collect for the sake of collecting. I mean, I know people who've collected moths and I've got hundreds and thousands of species and they're lying in a container in a box. And then no work has been done on them. I mean, that's a complete shame. So I think limited collection by knowledgeable people housed in uh, uh, proper museums, that's fine. Otherwise, it's not. Okay, good to know, Sanjay. There's another question by Abhishek Gulshan. Uh, do moths pollinate a certain plant of commercial value or maybe more of a necessity in a certain plant of the world? So the thing is that there was a, actually a study in UK, uh, which came out last year. And, uh, you know, I think some of you may know that uh, the insect species that contributes most to pollination is basically bees. The second most important insect group as a pollinator was uh, turned out to be turned out to be moths, believe it or not, more than butterflies. Uh, and that's largely, I think, got to do with the fact that there are far more moth species and hence far more numbers right. of moths. Yeah. And uh, the fact is that almost every flower that uh, flowers at night, that blooms at night, is pollinated by moths. By moth. Commercially uh, important, not important, that I don't know. I mean, all your fruiting trees, uh, a lot of your fruiting trees are pollinated by moths. Uh, your apples, your plums, all of them are uh, are pollinated by moths. So yes, there are many, many commercial plant species that are pollinated by moths. Okay, the next question, Sanjay, is uh, how do you make a moth screen material and size? Oh, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, uh, mo many, many places that I go, I don't even use a moth screen. If I have a lightly colored Red wall, sheet. a white wall, no, white wall is good enough. Lightly colored wall, green wall, pink wall, white wall, that's good enough. But if you are actually making uh, a moth screen, then typically I would say a good size is uh, six feet by four feet uh, in terms of length and uh, height. And uh, a good thing would be to actually get, uh, you know, put hooks, cloth hooks on the corner so that you can tie them to the rope. Easily, yes. And uh, then the bulb light source is what is the most important thing. I mean, it should be a white sheet. It doesn't matter what it is. Make it cotton. Don't make it uh, a smooth surface like uh, terry cotton because the moths won't be able to grip it. Use cotton. Size can be whatever it is. More important than the screen itself is the light source. Yeah, this is something we can all do at home now that uh, we have nothing else to do, no place to go. I think moth screen should be a good idea to spend some time looking at things we don't know. 
next question, um, Sanjay. Uh, are moths as host specific as butterflies are? Yep, very much similar to uh, very much similar to. Uh, They're essentially the same thing. The same thing, exactly the same. There are some moths that are generalists that have got dozens of uh, larval host plants. There are some, uh, you know, polyphagous. There are some that are monophagous, which is just one moth, fa one one family of moth plants, uh, of uh, plants. So yes, just like butterflies, no no difference. Okay, the next question by Rakesh Kumar is. What kind of food the adult moth eat apart from nectar? So they eat nectar, the human sweat, blood, um, uh, mammal uh, droppings, bird droppings, I moist see. soil, uh, ro see. rotting fruit, eye secretions of uh, mammals. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I mean, uh, beer, wine, if they can lay their hands on them, <laughs> carcasses. Everything, yeah. I mean, whatever butterflies feed on, that's what moths feed on. Okay, this is leading uh, leading question to that only. Do vampire moths suck human blood? Yeah, there are. I mean, that's why they're called vampire moths. So there are vampire moths that suck mammal blood. So it can be a human also. It can be basically what they do is they go to the the soft part near the eye, you know, where they can actually penetrate and they can feed. So they do it for. I mean. They can do it on humans. I'm sure they can do it on humans. They do it on, I mean, if we allow them to, they do it on mammals. They do it on cattle and stuff like that. So yes, they can. Uh, okay. Uh, Sanjay, uh, as you know that this uh, session is also live on Facebook. So there's a few questions from Facebook. Okay. Uh, we have a question by uh, Surya Prakash, sir. He's yeah. asking, what are the biochemicals of the secretions released by moths to ward off predators okay so it basically depends on depends on the moth okay different moth families have got uh, different kind of uh, chemicals i think the best known example is maybe what the example that i should give i never talked of this moth family but uh, there's a moth family uh, which is called uh, zygonids or burnet moths and uh, these moths uh, basically secrete hydrogen cyanide so basically, mm. uh, the caterpillars as well as the adult moths of this family, these are day flying moths. They are normally brightly colored. Uh, they basically get, uh, they sequester hydrogen cyanide from the plants at the caterpillar stage. But the adult moths can also produce their own hydrogen cyanide in case the, the caterpillar is not able to access it. So this is really the best known chemical in moths for uh, as an anti-predatory strategy. But Arctids have different chemicals and lichen moths have different chemicals and so on. So yeah, it's super interesting, this sort of stuff, yeah. the biochemical stuff yeah, of yeah, moths. Yeah, yeah. Just a different level. Uh, the next question, uh, you have touched on it a little bit with uh, moths being important as pollinators. But uh, Ashish Divan is asking, how are moths useful in nature? So maybe beyond pollination. So basically, I think the two, uh, the two, main, the, the two main roles, main roles, I would say, one is, of course, pollination. And the second is they are a food source for so many nocturnal creatures. I mean, we often forget the fact that, uh, you know, everything in nature is linked. So the main uh, uh, food source for bats is moths. The main food source for many nocturnal creatures, uh, uh, such as uh, toads, frogs, is moths. Uh, birds, like Anchal is saying, night jars, frog mouths. Moths, that's what they yeah, eat. Yeah, so they survive on moths. They survive on moths. Yes, yes. Is it the, the next question is, is it possible to do moth life cycles like butterflies we are doing? This is by Chaudhary Jayatissa. So probably she's asking uh, about it, rearing of uh, caterpillars. Exactly the same thing that you do with moths, uh, with butterflies, what? with only one difference which is uh, in most cases, uh, uh, the moths, the caterpillars actually burrow into mud and uh, they pupate uh, under the mud. So in addition to what you do for butterflies, what you should do is you should have a uh, shallow layer of soil in the container so that the caterpillar can burrow into the soil and pupate there. Other than that, it's exactly the same as butterflies. And would you uh, recommend people do it for moths also? Yes, absolutely. There is 
there is very little in fact uh, you know on the moths of india website we have a rule that just sending a, uploading a caterpillar doesn't work because we know so little about uh, life cycles of moths that in most cases we are just not able to identify which species it is from a caterpillar unlike butterflies where we basically know or 60 70% of butterfly life cycles in india have been studied uh, not so in the case of moths but yes you should definitely rear them upload them to the moths of india website the entire life cycle and we'll help you identify them mm -hmm. the next question this is also from facebook by stephen babu uh, the question is you mentioned some caterpillars create itching could yes. there be any other dangerous reactions upon touching caterpillars or moths <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah yes there are so for example they're called tigers yeah. no yeah there's lots of different <laughs> things so you know people ask me uh, you know i actually I, on occasion i tell people hey you know moth watching can be dangerous so what do you mean moth watching can be dangerous so for example it happened to me in the northeast once that uh, there's a, a group of moths called notodontidae uh, and uh, forget the caterpillar but this moth has scales and if the moth scales get onto your body Uh, you will be itching for like hours and hours and hours and the moth basically came and sat on my neck uh, and i sort of brushed it off and the scales fell down my back and i was itching the whole night so not just but not just caterpillars even the moths have uh, mechanisms to protect themselves which can cause itching and of course the worst thing that can happen to you is what happened to me on one of my visits in eagle nest is a micro moth went into my ear and sort of couldn't get out so it was fluttering there for 12 hours and uh, you know so on many occasions i tell people especially when i'm with children that it's good to actually have ear you know cover your ears cover ear, so yeah. that moths don't get in yeah. uh, yeah, ear muffs or something like that is a good idea i mean i don't do it but it's happened to me I've, once I've in, heard a, these in a decade too. i heard these stories too people happened to me once in a moths, decade yeah. i think that's part of the it's it's a risk i'm willing to take yeah Okay, so moving on to the next question. This is also from Surya Prakash sir. It says, uh, "Does your website, I think it means Moths of India, have image matching tool for ID?" No, no, not yet, not yet. Yeah, the As thing of is now that you can do it from the groups. Sorry, yeah. As of thing... now, we can do it from the groups, right? Like you showed in the uh, yeah, yeah, slide. Yeah. So the thing is that right now we have, uh, you know, the the thing is uh, the you know moth identification is tough with images. and uh, what we we have a system whereby we have a, a team of something like uh, 12 uh, people uh, from india as well as international uh, experts who review the moths that get uploaded by people each moth needs to be reviewed and approved by at least two people uh, uh, we don't have an in, in intelligent matching system yet it's in the pipeline Uh, i can tell people that while we have uh, 8000 odd images on the website right now uh, moths that have been uploaded by people but that haven't been identified there's probably 15000 more images that are there that haven't been uploaded yet so at some point in time once we have critical critical mass we do intend to do this but we don't have it now okay um, sanjay we'll just take last two questions now uh one of our favorites what are your tips on phot photographing moths so the 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 thing that uh, is important when you when you are using uh, moth photographs for identification what happens is that most people basically take a photograph of the moth as they see it uh, but typically that's not good enough hmm. uh, so the the things that you should try and photograph is that uh, if the fore wing hind wing if the uh, hind wing of the moth is not visible uh, try and get to photograph the hind wing also because the hind wing is also important uh, try and photograph it from the front so that you can get the antenna try and photograph it from the side so that you can get a, a photograph of its legs and the color of its legs and finally try and get a photograph of its underside i mean something that i do is that uh, you know i just take a stick and i put a moth on the stick or even on my finger and i try and photograph the underside of the moth because in many species you need all the help you can get i mean and uh, many cryptic moths exactly. 
uh, you know as much information as you can get the better it is yeah that's good to know what sort of photographs do we need to actually click so we can upload them on sites like mods of india for them to right. be useful for identification so this is yeah thank you uh last question is by pia and the question is any studies to know the proportion of caterpillar populations that are decimated by fungus no no i know that i'm aware of okay, i don't know just because I that was a very small answer yeah i mean i think that uh, this this number gets touted by many people hmm. which is 3 to 5% of all butterfly and moth caterpillars reach uh, become adults and the balance 95% is lost to predation is lost to uh, parasitism and uh, probably chemicals and pesticides and whatever else Hmm. but i don't i don't know of any study that's been done in terms of what percentage is parasites i don't i'm not aware of it okay i'll take one last question okay uh, sanjay thank you for being so patient there are lots of questions and lots more but uh, this is a simple one why few moths as you mentioned in your slides do not eat in adult stage how do they survive without food so the thing is that uh, you know for these uh, non feeding moths which include uh, uh, saturnids that includes the monkey moths include some limacodids so the thing is that the only purpose the only purpose of a moth is to mate after it has mated its purpose is over as far as that species is concerned it still has a role in nature of course you know in terms of uh, pollination and food but for that species after it has mated its purpose of life is over so these large moths uh, you know especially the saturnids as well as the, the eutrophs or the monkey moths which don't feed uh, the they live off the food that is accumulated at the caterpillar stage and stored in the body so whatever energy they need basically comes from uh, the what is stored in their body uh, and accumulated during the larval stage and why do they have short lives i mean the fact is that uh, uh, they are large moths they anyway very difficult for them to survive and escape predation so they have figured out that rather than uh, having mouth parts and trying to escape predators the best way is to have a short life mate very very quickly and that's it and many of these non feeding moths they have uh, uh, trick tricks and uh, tricks up their sleeve to be able to sense the mate from a very very quickly so for example the saturnid moths the males have very very prominent antenna and the reason they are prominent antenna is that uh, they are able to sense uh, the presence of females from literature says as far as 3 uh, or 4 km 3 or 4 km away because they need they you know they don't have a long life they very very quickly need to find a mate uh, mate with the the male or the female and that's it so they use techniques to very quickly find their mate thank you thank you sanjay uh this has been an absolutely fantastic uh session and i know for a fact that now lots of people are going to get now you can tell them remind them about the contest that nick and you are running yeah and uh, so there are two uh, contests no one is Uh, five people who are not on the website uploading five identified species you can identify them in whichever way you want eh? you can contact soil you can contact me you can contact whoever how I you identify them you're not bothered you're even... part of the contest <laughs> no not allowed <laughs> <laughs> so that is one and second is the Wait, the, thank you, the, Sanjay. Zai, the zais one yeah. which uh, you know i i would just one thing nick for the zais competition uh, yeah. whatever answers we select as the best is final okay we won't get into discussions in that way right. why was that person's answer selected and not mine because uh, you know there's no end to that perfect yeah i'll leave it to uh, nick to yeah. close this off it was really helpful and fantastic insights yeah that was so so fantastic and the great world of moth yeah. so thank you for making that easier and showing us how to id on the moths of india yeah. and for everybody tomorrow and we have this fantastic session on the mysteries of of uh, bird migration by mike prince
So same place, same time, same ID, and see you tomorrow. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Bye.